Hey guys, Wilk here. So one of the most frequently asked questions that we get here at Boosted Media is what gear are we using to record our videos? Now obviously we record a lot of different types of videos here. So from sim racing videos inside the giant sim rig to studio style videos, reviews and everything in between. So what I wanted to do today is run you through all of the gear that we're using from cameras to lighting, audio equipment, camera dollies, everything that's required to get the type of content that we're doing. Now as Tom who's hiding behind the camera will tell you, I'm a bit of a stooge when it comes to spending money on gear and I do like to try and minimize costs wherever I can. So I think you might be surprised by some of the things that we've done here to try and reduce the overall costs and I think you might find by the end of this video that a lot of the things that we do here are actually a lot more accessible than you might have thought. So let's jump in, let's have a closer look starting with the camera gear and have a look at how we do things. All right, so we may as well start off with the most expensive bit of gear, which is our Sony A7 Mark III. Now, I bought this probably about nine or 10 months ago now, upgraded from a Mark II. Just wanted that slightly better 4K performance was the main reason for upgrading. And we've got this connected to a Sony Zeiss 24 to 70 F4 lens. So that gives us a decent amount of depth of field and a good amount of focal range for the kind of setting that we're using it in here. I do also have a 50 millimeter F1.8 lens, but I actually don't use Use that all that often these days. This lens seems to suit the need for pretty much everything that we do here in the studio, at least at this point in time. So this has also got a little preamp module connected to it as well, which allows us to run an XLR microphone directly into it. But we'll talk about audio stuff a little bit later on. So Sony A7 Mark III, this is what we're using for basically any of the shots where it's a fixed camera looking directly at us at the table. We don't actually use this for any of our B-roll footage though, which is quite interesting. So if we come over here now, let's have a look at what we use for B-roll. So this is our little Edelchrome Dolly 1, and this is actually a really cool little module. Tom is the one who knows the most about this, but basically it's got little wheels on the bottom of it, and it can be programmed to do all kinds of funky things. So it will roll around on the table. Now it doesn't have any sensors on it. So I always trust Tom to not accidentally drive it off the top of the table and smash it and the camera that's attached to it. But we actually mount our little Sony ZV-1, which Tom's holding right now to shoot this video. And we'll run you through that in just a moment too. Sits up on the top of the little tripod mount here. And this is what allows us to get those nice dynamic B-roll shots where the camera's kind of rolling around. We used to actually use a camera track, which was relatively cheap and allowed us to sort of roll the camera along a surface. But with the Edelchrome, what we find is we're able to get much more organic looking shots where the camera is sort of able to get in and get detail, move around and pan and do all kinds of things that you just can't do when you're relying on a single axis of movement. So that works really well. Not the cheapest thing in the world, but that's definitely been a good investment and a lot cheaper than a lot of the other giant rigs that I see a lot of people using these days. So one thing that we are finding is as technology advances, a lot of these things are miniaturizing and getting cheaper, much like what we see in the sim racing industry as well, so that's always good to see. Now while we're on the subject of cameras, Tom is using the Sony ZV-1 to record this right now, and this is quickly becoming one of my favorite cameras ever. It's got so many features which are just brilliant for vlogging style videos. So we're actually using this, as I said before, to do all of our B-roll footage as well because it just works so well. Really nice depth of field with the f1.8 to 2.8 lens as well. And it actually has some really great features specifically for vlogging style videos. So it even has a feature in there where you can hold something up to the camera and it'll focus on it really quickly as well. So sometimes we might use it for a fixed shot where I'm holding things up to the camera where we really wanna get that quick autofocus. Sometimes it is hard to react fast enough with manual focus and it actually seems to work really well. We often use it for the second camera as well. So often we'll have this set as like a fixed position that's just pointing at me. And then Tom will be using the ZV-1 on a second tripod and kind of zooming in on the detail of what I'm doing. And again, that's kind of what's able to give us that nice dynamic two shot kind of style video, similar to what they do at Unboxing Therapy, which is kind of the motivation for that. So that works really well as well. And then we move over to the SIM. We often use the ZV-1 mounted up on this little tripod head here as well. And that's what gives us that nice over shoulder shot that you'll be familiar with from our videos. So you can see this is attached to a giant boom arm here. Now, we're not gonna go into all the details on that now because we do have a video where we covered that. But basically what we're doing here is we've got an assembly which is attached to our motion platform. So we've got side to side movement on the traction loss. And what that allows us to do is have the camera in a fixed position relative to where I'm sitting so that when the platform moves around, it doesn't look like the camera's moving independently of what I'm doing. Now we also have a system here, which we've got another video on as well for motion compensation. So we've got a little uh, track IR module sitting here. This moves around relative to the camera position as well. 
And then that movement is tracked on the little sensor, which is sitting up there. And what that allows us to do is adjust the perspective on the screen so that as the platform moves around, it all stays in position relative to the fixed position of those screens. But again, have a look at the detailed dedicated video we have on that if you wanna understand more about that. But Sony ZV-1 sits up here. Then we just have a cheap little webcam sitting down there, a Razer Kyo, which I use as a pedal cam on the rare occasion that I do have a pedal cam in the videos. Look, to be honest with you guys, I probably wouldn't recommend that camera. The reason I bought that one was because it does have an inbuilt ring light, so it gives it a little bit of extra illumination, but I've just found it can be quite cumbersome. Uh, one of the things it does quite regularly is when you boot up the computer, it dumps all of its settings, so you have to go in and set all the gain and brightness and contrast and everything from scratch every time, which can be pretty frustrating. So if you guys are aware of a really great webcam that's great for that kind of usage, do let me know in the comments because I'll definitely pick one up. Uh, so that is pretty much it in terms of fixed cameras. Then we just move across into our action cameras and we use those for what you guys see in the primary view for all of our sim racing videos. So as you'd know, we don't actually use any in-game or screen capture footage anymore. Everything we do is captured with external cameras which are then recording what's on the screen. That gives you that nice dynamic shot with our arms showing as we're turning the wheel as well. So we have this little shoulder mount here. And again, this is mounted to the um, seat mover platform. So what that gives is a nice dynamic shot as the seat's moving around, as you're kind of driving over bumps and stuff, it kind of gives that organic feel of the camera moving around with the car's movement on the road. So that's how we're able to achieve that. And what we mount on that is either our GoPro 9 or our Insta360 ONE R. Now, the GoPro 9 is really great because it has a HDMI output if you're using it with the media mod, which we have here, which is kind of this case around the outside. So we can take the HDMI output from the GoPro 9 and put it directly into our streaming computer. Again, we've got a video which we've done where we explained exactly how we do that. So we are able to get the footage into the streaming PC, put all our overlays in, put our webcam in for our pedal cam, and then we're able to stream that out live or record videos in that manner. And that's really good for workflow as well because it means we're not having to edit all the footage together in post. It's all kind of just done in real time. We can just spit the video out straight away. So obviously being a two-man team here at Boosted Media, any Anything we can do to increase workflow and make things more streamlined is you know, a massive advantage for us. So that's a really great advantage of the GoPro 9. Low light performance isn't absolutely fantastic with this camera though. So that's where the Insta360 ONE R comes into play. So this has got a one inch sensor on the front. We do also have the little 360 module for this as well. We might actually do a separate video where we go into more detail on comparing these two cameras and maybe having a look at this in more detail too, because it is a really cool little gadget that we've discovered recently. So this is what we've been using for all of our point of view shots for about the last maybe month, month and a half now. One inch sensor on the front of this. So it does have the bigger sensor for more low light performance. Obviously the more light that gets in through to the sensor, the better things look. And what we found basically with this camera, we get slightly less grain, we get a little bit more definition in the color, skin tones look a little bit better as well. One of the things you might've noticed when we were using the GoPro in our uh, live stream videos is that sometimes my arms look a little bit yellow or they lack a little bit of definition, they look a little bit flat. Uh, this camera definitely improves that quite significantly. And if you watch any of our more recent videos, like the ones we've been doing in AMS2 recently, they're all done with this. And then I put this helmet on my head, it looks pretty ridiculous. I strap it on as well, because safety first. And what this allows me to do is have the camera in a nice low position, because when you have the camera up high, because we're running on a screen setup like this, and if Tom comes over here and actually moves the camera up and down, you'll see what I mean. If you're not in exactly the right position, because we're looking at a two dimensional screen here, things get out of proportion and look very funny. It's not like when you move up in a real car, you can kind of look up over the dash because we're not running any sort of tracking or anything like that for the camera position other than the side to side movement that we've got with the track IR. So we need to make sure our camera position is in exactly the right spot so it looks good on camera, but obviously we need to be able to drive it as well. So what I do is I sit in the rig, nice and low with the helmet on, and that is able to give us that nice perspective and I'm still able to see what I'm doing. And you can see, even though I've got that metal bar that's kind of passing in front of my eyes, it's low enough down that I'm focusing past it. And it's kind of like a halo in an F1 car. You don't really notice it after a while. If I kind of pay attention to it or close one eye, I can see it pretty clearly. But when I'm looking at what I'm doing, it's kind of just like a blurry bar in the middle. Kind of like if you just hold your finger up in between your eyes and do the old trick that I used to do to cross your eyes. It kind of just looks like that. So not too impeding and it's not too heavy either. It's nice and light. So yeah, it works really well. The main challenge that we had was just trying to find a helmet that didn't have a big bulb on the back of it that kind of bumped up against the headrest because that 
kind of makes you crank your head forward. We also needed to have something that had a brace on the back here too that was uh, going to allow us to tighten everything up and kind of fix it in position so it wouldn't slop around on our head. One of the most challenging things we found, and we did actually experiment with a few different things, we had a um, GoPro head mounted strap as well. And what we found with this is when you put it on your head, even though you might have it in the perfect position at the start of the video, what would happen is it would ultimately end up a little bit sideways or maybe drooping a little bit or just moving around. So it'd look great at the start of the video, but after a 20 minute race, the camera angle would be all the way out. And again, if you come over here and have a look, you can imagine if the camera does move out of alignment and you start seeing the black area above the screen, then you know obviously the, the immersion's ruined and you know that kind of just ruins the whole effect. So trying to again sort of just maximize workflow and make sure we're doing things in the most efficient way and that's kind of what we came up with. So it looks a little bit silly but it definitely gets the job done and yeah we've been really impressed with that uh, Insta360 ONE R. So far it definitely works better in the low light conditions than the GoPro does. Unfortunately it doesn't have an HDMI output though uh, and it also won't allow you to stream via RMTP using the one inch sensor, which is a bit of a disadvantage. So we do still need to use the GoPro for when we're doing our live streaming or anything like that, if we're trying to record races with overlays. But for anything else, we're using the Insta360 ONE R at the moment. So I think that pretty much covers everything in terms of camera. So let's move on into lighting now. So you guys would have seen recently, we did a video on our ambient lighting system. If you have a look up on the roof there, you can actually see that running right now. So three different light bars, and those are all controlled by what's going on on the screen of the PC. So I'll just quickly bring up an edge window here and just show you what I mean. So just a nice white page here, you'll be able to see how it impacts the ambient light. So as I move it down, and again, we can adjust relative to what position we want on the screens here. But as I move it around, you can see the ambient lighting above changes. So that allows us to replicate things like shadows on the track and do all kinds of cool things. So when we're recording, generally what we do is we drop all of the other lights down. We sometimes just leave these two lights here running at a low sort of about maybe 30% brightness with quite a warm color, just to give us a little bit of backlighting on our arms and on the wheel. But otherwise we're relying purely on just the light that's coming off the screens as well as the ambient lighting to get the job done. Now, all these lights that we have above us here are all um, completely RGB as well. So we can completely control those throughout the entire color spectrum as well as brightness. So sometimes you might've seen some shots where we have blue light inside the studio or red light, something like that. That's all done. And we just talk to Google and just tell it what color we want and the colors change just as simple as that. Then we also have a couple of little studio lights as well. These are just really cheap Amazon lights. I think they were about $50 each maybe, something like that. And they've got, if we have a look on the back here, just a couple of controls here for color temperature between 3200K, so warmer and 5600K, which is more towards the blue side of the spectrum and then a nice brightness control as well. So I've actually got a second one of those running over on the other side of the room as well, just to sort of bounce off the ceiling and give the room a little bit more light at the moment. So normally if we're recording on the table over here, what we do is we'd have one of those lights on either side kind of beaming in towards the center. And then we also have a little key light, which we sit down behind, which beams up from behind and gives us that kind of nice effect on the background as well. And that's pretty much it for lighting. It's really not overly complex. I guess the main thing is that we are in a pretty much completely white room here. We also have complete control over the ambient light. So there's no windows, there's no light coming in externally at all. And that allows us to have complete control over the room. We can go to complete darkness if we want to. You may have also noticed that we've taken the tracks down off this wall temporarily as well. We're gonna be doing a review in the next week or so of a very exciting 4K gaming projector. So we're preparing to do that and we're gonna put that up on this wall, which is very exciting. So stay tuned for that one. So let's move on into audio now. And I know a lot of you guys that have been watching the channel for a while will remember we struggled with the acoustics for a very, very long time. Almost, I think the first year that we were operating inside the studio, we had all sorts of issues with echo and just weren't able to really get the audio nailed down. Now, what you can see behind us here on the sim rig, as you guys would have seen when we built this, um, and we do have a video for that as well, link down in the description, we've actually got some acoustic bats sitting behind these curtains and those you know, aren't cheap at all. They're actually really expensive, but they really deaden the sound in here. But because we've got blank walls around a lot of the rest of the room. It still has a bit of a live kind of sound to it. It's not too dampened. So overall, it sounds quite rich and quite nice, at least to my ears. 
feel free to disagree. But that works quite well and that allows us to use a variety of different microphones inside the room without too much issue with consistency between them as well, which works quite well. So anytime that we're driving on the sim, generally speaking, we'll be using the Rode NTG4, which is a shotgun microphone. Now this is actually designed to go quite a bit further away from us than what we have if we need it to. But what it basically does is it focuses in the sound on a very defined point you know, pretty much directly in front of the microphone. It doesn't pick up much around. So this works really well for picking up audio without having too much spill from things like shifters or fans inside computers and things like that, that distort the sound and pick up things that we don't really want inside the audio. And then that is outputting through an XLR cable into our little Go XLR box down here, Go XLR Mini. This has been another absolutely brilliant piece of kit. So this allows us to take our microphone input, which is this guy, We've got our chat, which is our Discord, and uh, we've actually got it linked to the same microphone as well. So when I'm recording audio for you guys on stream, it's actually the same microphone that I'm using for the chat as well. So all I need to do is set that to push to talk, and then you guys hear the microphone, but they only hear it if I'm pushing my push to talk button. Then we also have a channel for the audio coming out of the game or whatever is going on on the system. And then I've got a separate channel here as well, which I've set for my crew chief so I can control all of my levels independently. And then I take the output of that, that goes into my headphones. Sometimes I'll be using some Bose noise cancelling headphones. Those actually work really well. Or if I'm wearing the helmet, which obviously I can't wear with those, I'm just using some little in-ear earbuds and these are actually really old Sony XBA4 earbuds, which I actually won in a competition back when I was working at Sony. They were crazy expensive at the time. And uh, they're really good. They don't have a whole lot of bass in them. Uh, I'm actually looking at getting some clip-on earbuds that don't fall out quite so often, but I'm kind of just making do with what I have laying around at the moment, which is the reason for those. So we take the headphone output and that's what I'm listening to. Then we also take a line level output from the Go XLR and that runs around into this little Audient Evo 4 capture device. That allows us to take the analog line level signal from the Go XLR, convert it into a digital signal, which we then capture on our streaming PC. Remembering again that we're running running the Go XLR on our dedicated PC for the SIM, and then we're actually recording all the audio and everything on a separate PC, which is the reason why we have to have the separate capture device. But again, we do have a separate video where we went into all the details on the dual PC setup and how all that works. And we are actually in the process of building an updated system at the moment, which is gonna be wall mount. It's gonna sit up here and it's gonna be absolutely bonkers. So make sure you subscribe so you can see that one as well when that comes out. Uh, yeah, we're kind of in the works with that at the moment. It's a very exciting project. Now, other than that, audio wise, there's a couple of other microphones that we use as well. Uh, you guys will remember that have been watching for a while, we bought this little radio pack and receiver about a year ago. Now we've actually retired this. It worked really well, it was absolutely brilliant. But then we discovered these little guys, which are the Rode Wireless Go system. Now they've actually just released an updated version of this, which I'm gonna buy because it looks absolutely brilliant. But this is a little transmitter. So I've got my lapel mic, which is a, what is it? It's a Sennheiser MKE2 lapel microphone. I think that was about $100, so it wasn't cheap, but it is very, very good compared to some of the mics that we tried out previously, so definitely would recommend that one. So that's just going into this little pack here, charges via USB-C, so we get a full day's usage out of this pretty much. And then it pairs with a little receiver, wirelessly of course, which is actually plugged into the camera that Tom's using at the moment. That's just got a three and a half mil jack on it, so we can plug that into the A7 Mark III if we need to, we can plug it into the input on the Go XLR if we need to, we can basically plug it into anything we want. And and that allows us to capture the audio wirelessly. Now the replacement version of this, the version two, is dual channel as well. So that's gonna work perfectly for us because it means that Tom and I can both wear a lapel microphone rather than having to use a shotgun when it's both of us on camera. And that'll both run into the one receiver which can plug into the camera. It also records the audio on the device itself as a redundant system so that if you have an issue with the footage, you can capture the audio and use it that way later on as well. So we'll definitely be picking one of those up. But these things have been absolutely brilliant. I wish I could go back in time and not have bought this and just bought this instead. I think that, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. It works absolutely brilliantly, but it just ended up being a little bit more than what we needed. And these, these things ended up being a lot more practical. Uh, another great thing about these as well is you can actually use them in reverse and use it as like an audio monitor as well, which works really well. And that is pretty much everything that we use in terms of gear from day to day to produce all the different types of content that we do 
here at Boosted Media. So, I mean, we do spend quite a bit of time moving cameras around and stuff like that. I think ultimately we'll probably end up buying a second ZV-1 and having it mounted permanently on the rig so we're not having to change settings. I think probably one of the biggest losses of time that we have here in the studio is just moving things around, resetting lights, uh, and you know, setting setting camera settings as well, because obviously the settings that we use for handheld type footage, like what we're doing right now, are different from what we have when it's fixed on the rig. So having dedicated camera gear where we're not having to go through menus and set up, we can just kind of set and forget for each different scenario is gonna work quite well for us. But once we move into a bigger studio space where we're not having to kind of generally move stuff around anyway, that's gonna make things a lot easier too. But really when it comes down to it, I'm happy with all the gear that we got at the moment. I don't really feel the need for any better cameras or anything like that at this point in time. I think, yeah, as I said, we might just get a couple of extra cameras the same just to give us a little bit more flexibility and a little bit uh, better workflow. So I really hope that's given you a better idea of how we record our footage here at Boosted Media. And I'd say probably the one thing I would recommend if you're just starting out and you're wanting to get a good camera and a good microphone set up, definitely this wireless go system, probably go with the version two that has that onboard recording as well as the dual mic capability as well, just in case you end up having a second person. And the Sony ZV-1 camera honestly has been absolutely brilliant and immensely versatile too. I mean, we could probably actually get away with using one of those in as a replacement for the Sony a7 Mark III, I would even go as far as saying. So I definitely say if you're looking at a camera that you can use for all types of different content, that would definitely be my go-to at this point in time. And that is pretty much it, guys. So leave a thumbs up if you found this video interesting and useful. Of course, make sure you're subscribed as well so you don't miss future videos. And yeah, we'll put some links down in the description below for all the gear that we've talked about in today's video. And if you do have any further questions, anything you'd like to know more detail on or any suggestions as well anything that you think we could do to further improve things in terms of workflow and uh, efficiency definitely let us know as well but thank you very much for watching and we'll see you again soon bye